Well, I think we should start, you know. Otherwise, you know, somebody lunch hour will be shortened, right? So, do you want to cut the lunch hour? <laughs> I, I think we should start. Otherwise, you know, otherwise somebody's lunch hour will be cut here. So, first speaker is Najelka. Hello, everybody. So, my name is Najelka Jagar, and... I will basically talk about some properties of the forecast errors from the data assimilation perspective. And I would like to thank the organizers that I'm here and also Professor Maida that I am here. It's a really, uh, it's a really great place and I enjoyed and learned a lot uh, in the past uh, three days. So when we are talking about forecast errors uh, for the data assimilation, then we are thinking specifically about the very short forecast range, few hours up to 12 hours mainly. And the very specific questions I would like to, to describe in this talk are listed here. So I would like to explain how the forecast errors are calculated, what they look like in the current NWP forecast numerical weather prediction models, what we understand about these errors what properties we do understand and what we don't understand, but we would like to understand. I will explain what is the flow dependency. I will always compare or contrast the mid latitudes and the tropics and try to, to, to explain why or what are the substantial properties of forecast errors in the tropics in comparison to the mid latitudes. And uh, I'm afraid that my talk may be boring for some of you. <laughs> I will speak from the point of view of a meteorologist, which uh, by default means I, that I'm a poor mathematician, but tomorrow uh, John Harlem will explain, uh, will explain um, data assimilation, which mathematicians call filtering in a more uh, formalistic, uh, proper, formalistically proper, proper way. So what we are doing in NWP, we are, we are really doing what we call cycling, and that means we combine all observations which are denoted here by this vector y with uh, something which what we call previous information or short range, basically short range forecast or background information or first guess or prior. All these names are used. And we combine these two pieces of information into what we call analysis denoted by xa. And this, these are initial conditions for NWP. And then we run forecast mainly for 10 days by a global NWP model, but we stop as soon as after six hours or 12 hours in global models or after three hours or nowadays there is even one hour cycling in the limited area models. And then we repeat, we take all observations which arrived uh, since the last assimilation step, we, we inject them, we try to do this intelligently in the model and then we do our forecast again. So at some certain forecast range, we can always compare forecasts of different lengths and discuss how much the forecast changed and, and how much the forecast improved. So what, when we verify forecasts uh, on daily basis, what, what we do as a users is always we compare them with observations, which is fine, especially if you verify unassimilated quantities which are not assimilated, like precipitation. Uh, to do it with the observations. And what they do at uh, NWP centers like NCEP or ECMWF and other big centers, they verify their own forecasts. They fo their forecast against their analysis. And this is how they measure progress in NWP. So th this is the famous anomaly correlation coefficient for the 500 hectopascal surface. And this is not really what, but what, we, what we need, what we do in data assimilation. So when, we, when you verify forecasts, you are really verifying errors which arrive from these three basic reasons for the errors. So you are, you are verifying forecast errors due to errors in the initial conditions, due to model errors, which are the most important thing which I will point out during my talk. And then also this thing which is usually pointed out by, by, by everybody much more than this thing, which is, which is more important to address, I think, in coming years. So, uh, how to, re to correctly verify forecast, this is impossible because to do that we need the truth and truth is not known. So what I will speak about are properties of the background of forecast errors which are 
which should be differences between forecast errors and the truth. And then we can talk about observation errors, which are differences between observations and truth. This is not also not available, but uh, at least in instrumental errors is easier to, to, to judge, to estimate than the background errors. And then we also should speak about analysis errors. And this is often forget, forgotten, especially in climate sciences, where climate sciences just take analysis or real analysis as a truth. And they try to tune their climate models to fit the, to fit the reanalysis. And reanalysis change. And sometimes what, what people use to judge as the uncertainty of our present understanding of general circulation is the spread between different reanalysis. But this is, we can question also this because better model, and we know we can judge this, better model of course produces a better reanalysis. So, um, other information which is very important, and this is what I will speak about mainly, are covariances. So what, for those who are not familiar with the formulation of the, of the data assimilation problem in NWP, I will just spend a few minutes to explain what this is. So when you look at the forecast for Bangalore, and that forecast is wrong, more or less, and, but the error of that forecast in Bangalore is associated with the error of the forecast 200 kilometers or 100 kilometers away. And this is quite intuitive, that fo forecast errors in different points in space are associated, related to each other, right? And of course, forecast error in Bangalore is not really related to forecast error in New York, because you know intuitively, even you are not physicists, that processes in the atmosphere right now in New York are not right now influencing weather in Bangalore, maybe later on, but not right now. But in very short range, we can talk about forecast errors at a certain point in space being correlated with forecast errors in the surrounding of that point. And what this matrix B does, it is really describing how these forecast errors are corre correlated in space. Then, of course, forecast errors are correlated in time, because if you have a, some system which is, which is wrongly forecasted today, then it is likely that the forecast error six hours from now is also wrong, of course, because this error is propagated. So, so there is also temporal correlation in the forecast errors. And this is what we call um, flow dependency of forecast errors. So errors of today are related to the properties of the flow, which, which, is, which, which has these errors. And errors a few days from now, if the weather is very, very stable and nothing, import, nothing really interesting is going on, will be much different. Okay? So, but that is not taken into account uh, in this matrix. So you see this matrix has no time dependency. It's just uh, defined for a single time step. Or as I will explain, we usually com uh, uh, compute averages. This is observation error covariance matrix, and this is um, analysis error correlation matrix. And then what we do when we verify, for, when we analyze forecast errors, or when we do a simulation, we do not assimilate um, we, we do not assimilate model, model variables, but, but we try to keep observations as clean as they are, which means that we are going from the, from the model quantities to the observation space. And this process can be very, very uh, complicated and nonlinear in the case of radiances, for example. This means that we take model uh, temperature, pressure, and other fields, and that we compute radiances which are really observed by the satellites. And this is done by this observation operator, which is for the purposes of data simulation linearized. So what we would like to know, we would like to weight these two pieces of information in such a way that the result which we receive after, after uh, combining them has as small as possible error. And this is, this is what gives us what we call analysis. So the equation which, which, which you get, and this is the same equation which also comes from Kalman filter, we neglect model. In this process, I should point out, we neglect model error. So there is no model error here. Um, and this is solution of, which is we call best linear unbiased estimate. So there are some assumptions which are done to get this, uh, this solution, which are related that we assume all errors are unbiased. They are normally distributed. And some of these, of course, uh, can be questioned, but, but this is what we do. And, of course, 
Um, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> I will speak later about the other options. So what we do at teach assimilation step, we keep our old forecast, yeah, XB, first guess, and then we change it uh, by this, what we call analysis increment. And in this analysis increment, we take f previous forecast, we interpolate, interpolate it to the observation point and to the observed quantity, take the difference to the, to the observation, and then weight it by this uh, large, large factor, because I didn't mention it explicitly, but dimension of this B matrix is N times N, and N is the dim dimension, it is the number of degrees of freedom of your model, of your problem. So in today's global NWP models, we would have seven or more, if you, if you account for all cloud, uh, cloud uh, variables, which are prognostic variables nowadays, and even ozone. So here you may have um, seven, let's say seven prognostic variables, time, times number of degrees of freedom of your system. And if, for example, ECMWF, if you take the grid which has 16 times 16 kilometers horizontally and 91 level vertically, you end up with over a million or few millions of degrees of freedom. So, and you know that this is, there is no way to handle this metrics. And of course, we have no information to build it because we don't know the truth. That's the main problem. But even if we know the truth, there is no way we can, we can handle this expression. Okay. And um, so, um, so I will explain you briefly how is this really done in, in NWP framework. So this solution is equivalent to minimizing this cost function, uh, which, really, uh, which this is really a quadratic function. And here you have the same, uh, this is analysis increment. This is XA minus XB. Uh, transpose background error covariance metric. This is what we call background term of the cost function. And this is observation term of the cost function. And it looks quite complicated here, but this M represents model. This, uh, this sum goes over different time steps because as satellite, assimil satellite observations are done continuously. So what we have to do, we have to take into account these observations over the certain time window but we cannot really do uh, carry out a simulation at the time frequency of the model integration. We do it in time slots, which are, for example, half an hour or one hour away. We combine observations, and then we do, this is the trajectory of the old forecast. Then we stop along this trajectory. We take a difference between the, between the, pre, between the trajectory and the observation. We sum up. We calculate cost function, and then we go back to the, to the initial point of the assimilation time window by running what, what is known as the, adjoint, as the adjoint model. So, as I said, this process is quite, quite involved. So, what is important, really, uh, to understand uh, in order to follow me from now on is really the importance of this weight, of the weight which we give to the difference between observation and, uh, and the previous, or previous information or first guess. So to understand this, imagine there is only one observation. So we are looking at this equation. Now imagine there is only one observation. So this, has, this is a scalar value. And then this H, uh, H operator has just the one at the point of this observation. So Y minus HX uh, is a scalar. And then what is left from this R is also a scalar. So this is all scalar. And then this, this, this equation tells you that analysis increment is proportional to the product B H transpose. And what is this? This is just a vector because this is n times n matrix. This is n times 1. So, uh, so you end up with, uh, with the impact of this single observation being proportional to the column of the B matrix. And what this means? This means that the, your observation will be spread into the model space uh, according to the covariances which are specified in this column of the matrix B. So, and this is, the result of this is, an example is shown here. So, if in your matrix you specify that temperature observation which is taken here, for example, at 15 degrees north, is just correlated with, uh, with surrounding 
with temperature in the surrounding of this point in an isotropic way. And how you know this? You derive this by looking at the properties of the forecast error. So what this matrix B does, it really spreads your observed information in the model space by respecting the correlations between this point and the surrounding points in the model space uh, according to the, to, the, to the relationships which you derive from your, from your forecast error properties. So uh, the other thing it does, it is also doing the balance. And what does this mean? This means that if you take observation in Bangalore of temperature, for example, and there are no any other observations 100 or 200 kilometers away from Bangalore, then when doing a simulation, you, you want to spread impact of this observation also around Bangalore. But you know that if you are changing temperature in cities around Bangalore, the wind, which always goes together with temperature according to equations which are solved by the model, the wind also has to be changed, okay? So you have to adapt, you have to change wind accordingly, accordingly if you are changing, changing temperature. And this is also done through, this, through the same uh, balance, through, through the same B matrix. And this is what we call balance in data simulation. And this is also what is specified uh, by analyzing properties of your forecast errors. So the B matrix, background error covariance matrix, is doing um, interpolation and fil filtering, but in a way we think about it. it it's just um, interpolating your observed information in an intelligent and physically appropriate way. And, and, this, um, and it is doing that not only to the observed quantities, but also to other quantities, and not only at this horizontally, but also vertically. So this is what, what we call balance. So that balance here for this single temperature observation, which was warmer than the previous forecast, so the largest impact of that, that temperature is found at the point where observation was taken, but then there is a smaller impact, which is isot almost isotropically spread in the neighborhood of this point. But then you see, in this case, the wind was also changed. And the way it was changed is something you know from your basic um, uh, meteorology training. This is uh, geostrophically balanced winds. So even we are at 15 degrees north, geostrophy already applies, at least in this model. So we are telling this to your system, to your data simulation system, through the B matrix, at least uh, the way it is done now in, in NWP, and that, that is what I, what I am uh, discussing. Uh, so uh, this is just another example. So if, if I, if this is just an example of, of what we do. So this is some simulated roof, and if you assimilate only temperature or only winds, you get only temperature and only winds, and this, these fields are just simply noisy, right? And uh, if you assimilate both, it's still noisy, and then, then there is extra noisy noise because the wind and temperature in this figure are not really uh, dynamically properly uh, related to each other. The way the model equations do that, the model equations which produce this truth. But if you do, prop, if you do proper data assimilation by assimilating either temperature or winds, you recover either winds or temperature. And uh, the result which you get is, depends on lots of things. It depends on the, on the way you specified background error covariances. It depends on, in 4D var, especially in the tropics, on the length of your assimilation window. And it very strongly depends on the model error. In this case, the model is perfect, but still uh, what we do in four-dimensional variational data simulation is that when we are taking observation at a, single, at a single point in time and we are propagating it forward in time and then backward in time in order to adjust it to the model equation, there is adjustment between the background error covariances and the model equations and your observed quantity. And then this can, uh, this can result in a, in a field which is quite different uh, from what you get in 3 var. So, and this is what you can see. I don't have 3 var solution, but 3 var solution can be, can be quite different. So, uh, yes? 
Uh, uh, here, here observations were taken either temperature or winds at maybe every 10 points, points in this, uh, in, in, in this grid. Uh, no, the, here I had multiple observations. Right, so obs observations were many. Uh, here, here I have many observations, so I, I don't remember how, how many. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so how to compute these forecast errors? In old days, when the first uh, uh, data simulation was, method was formulated for NWP, for ECMWF, there, were, there was no other information but forecast um, but observa observations, so people used the qu high quality radio sons observations, which, you, which, which were our highest quality observations, computed the four short range forecast errors minus observations, and then somehow scaled them and fitted them with some uh, functions. And this applied, for example, for the scale of United States, which has good coverage of radio sons, but it was difficult to do anything in the tropics. And as a result, uh, global models were really doing poor job in the tropics. And then in the 90s, there were other approaches, which I will just skip now. And uh, what is done nowadays is what is called ensemble method. And uh, what, what is a proper way to, to do this is, is, uh, is by doing ensemble Kalman filter. So what is done nowadays, we take ensemble of analysis. So this is the, our best guess for the analysis, which is called today deterministic forecast, for example, from ECMWF. And then there is an ensemble of analysis. This ensemble can be created in various ways. A typical way to do that is to uh, redo assimilation, independent assimilations. Uh, difference between them is that you perturb observation uh, just simply by, by taking random numbers from the distribution defined by the sigma O observation error, or one can perturb also model or combine these two. So, so you, have, uh, you have some, uh, you simply by doing that, by creating ensemble, you are sampling uncertainty of the initial, in the initial state, and then you run this ensemble, and then you measure the forecast error just by the divergence of this ensemble. So you, we are really looking at the differences between different ensemble members, or simply the, you can take mean of this ensemble and then compute the differences between individual ensemble members and the ensemble mean. And these differences are what we call forecast errors. So these are not true errors, but they are proxies of the forecast errors. So how they look, look today, this is from ECMWF model. This is a few years old, but the situation is the same uh, uh, now. So we, we have three dates, 1st July, 5th July, 10th July. And here you look at the three-hour forecast error in zonal winds uh, along, uh, along the latitude circle located at 45 north. So what you see that most of errors are in the upper troposphere where we have baroclinic development and some are also, this is related to the areas which are baroclinically active. And then of course these errors change in time depending on the development of baroclinic system in the, in the mid latitudes. When we go to the tropics, so I'm showing you a latitude circle around the equator, uh, around ITCZ area, and again, uh, I'm, I'm comparing it to the, to the 200 hectopascals in mid-latitudes. So these are now forecast errors. I, I'm not sure, three or 12 hour forecast errors. They are similar in the tropics. So what you see here, in the, and the time is running up. Always in my oh, plots, time is running up. Me, this yes. is the same ECMWF system? Yes, okay. yes. So, so, so this is few year old cycle, but uh, the, the things look the same now. So, so, okay, so uh, I can go right away to MJO. So what you see here, in the second part of July of this month, this is a single month, in the second part of, of July, MJO started. And here what you see is really a very uh, homogeneous area of the forecast errors propagating from uh, area of Indian Ocean to the east okay, in time. So what this tells you, this simply tells you what we call flow flow dependency. This tells you that the forecast errors are very intimately related to the flow. And this is not something any global NWP model is taking into account right now. Okay, so this is the point I will now elaborate more on. So when you go to, the, this is also interesting, when you go to ITCZ, at the tropopause, you see that in the ITCZ, 
there are more uh, forecast errors, again, related to the convective systems in the ITCZ, which, are, which show the westerly propagating features. Okay. Yes. So this system is based on linear tangent models. Uh, uh, no, no, this is, is this, this is directly the from the nonlinear, yeah, this, this, so this exactly, is the exactly, so this is, this, no, 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 this is the ensemble, okay. this is ensemble, yeah, yes, oh, thank uh, you. yes, thank okay, you. okay. Uh, yes. But these errors have nothing to do with reality, right? These are just differences between two members uh, of the ensemble, uh, yes, but the, In pla in other places. It does because these errors are simply associated with the flow which which caused them. So they are simply telling you, you that, that the, the velocity wind prediction. Yeah, yeah, this is zonal wind in particular. So what this tells you, this this tells you that the forecast errors in space and time develop in relation to the weather processes which are, which are really going wrong in the model. So, so this just tells you that forecast errors are very strongly flow dependent and that they have the same spatial and temporal scales as the underlying processes. And this is not something that data, so in, ideally we would like data assimilation to account for this, but this is not something we are doing, okay. So I, yes. I have a comment here because if this, yeah, this is the error in the wind field. Yes. And uh, we expect that in precipitation, when you have high precipitation, your errors are also higher. Yes. And things are related to precipitation. Yes. So anyway, this is, uh, do you think this is surprising or this is like a... No, a this is... No, this is not surprising, but my point here is that this is how it is, and uh, this is also good. This also means that, that the model is good, the errors develop where they should develop. But my point is, this is not something we are accounting for in data assimilation, as I will now... Yeah. Uh, only 20. I, I will... I, yeah, yeah, I will, I, I will speak now. Can you call it forecast error? Yes. Because it is a... No, no, see, it, what you are saying is, it is a... It is a how, how much is the difference among the members? That's, that's all right. Okay, so, 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 so it, 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 Okay, I can explain it later. Okay, okay, okay. so uh, will you give me this time? Okay, okay, I, I, okay, so, okay, so, uh, so, what are the, <laughs> so what are the forecast errors? So in this particular case, we say, Forecast errors are measured by the differences between individual members of the ensemble. So I take, for example, I, in this particular case, UCMWF, I have 20 members. I take 1 minus 2, 2 minus 3, 3 minus 4, etc. I create 19 differences, okay? And then the average of these differences is zero. So, so what I really do here, I, I really then square this and average this. So this is, the, this is, this is not true. This is proxy. But we have to do something. So, so I'm. Uh, okay. This is yes. how ensemble this filters is, work. Agree. This is. They have to do the but this is how they work. Sorry. Uh, yes. Sorry, just two minutes. Yes. But uh, my problem is the following. Ravi showed us a slide. Uh, Ravi showed a slide in which we saw several models trying to forecast the monsoon for some years, and you saw all the models were going wrong yes. for some years. Okay. Now, if I were measuring an error from of the model, I would say all the models have errors. But if you, for a minute, consider those models as ensemble members, you will find that the so-called forecast error that you call, you know, the spread between models is very small, but all the models are wrong. So you know what I'm saying? Okay. So to uh, 
to a naive meteorologist. Forecast error means error from observation. What yes. you are measuring is an appropriate measure of the yes. spread between ensembles. Uh, okay, yes. or how chaotic the system is, which I agree is an appropriate measure, but not a forecast error. Oh, okay, so, uh, okay, let me... It shouldn't be. It's, okay. it's, 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 it's really background. It, uh, but so I, I don't think it's, it's helpful. Like <laughs> it's, it's not helpful. It's not helpful to say Kalman. Yeah. Okay. So I will call it background. Okay. Sorry. I will call it first guess error. Okay. I will call it first guess error. So what we have to do? Okay. No, it's it's not. No, it's not ensemble spread strictly. So it's 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 really background background error. Yes. Yeah. It is really background error. So yeah, when I say error. background, but but uh, okay, yeah. So it, yes, but it's very different from taking a multi-model ensemble because in a single model, when you do data simulation, what you have to do. Okay. So. When compared with observation, yeah, and but we still have a small spread. But, but we should. Like, I think we have yeah, to yeah, okay. Okay. So, okay. No, uh, let me. So, so, okay. So, uh, okay. So, please don't mix forecast error in the in the case when the weather forecast will fail, and what when we do data simulation, we have to tell model how to really account for the properties of its forecast errors when weighting observations. So this is also not intuitive because you are used to think the observations are true, but they are not true. So, so, and I have all the time these problems with students. They don't want to accept that observations are not true. So it's, a, it's very hard to teach data simulation <laughs> <laughs> to meteorologists, not to, maybe not to mathematicians. So, so what we have to do in data simulation, we have to specify for that particular model what are the covariances of that model forecast errors. So we are not really interested in absolute forecast errors, but in the properties of forecast errors in that single model. Okay. And this is what they look like in ECMWF. So what you can see, that mo this is now averaged for one month. And this is information which goes into system when doing data assimilation. And I will further, here you see three model levels, and I will further, uh, uh, I will further just average it over latitude circles, and this is the representative picture of what the, show, of what the background errors look like in ECMWF. Okay, now forget about these top levels, this, this is mesosphere, and this, this is winter, winter hemisphere, and there were problems in radiation. So just look at the stratosphere and troposphere. So what you see is that the, this is the, I think it's honestly to say that this EMWF model is producing best forecast in the world at this moment. And that's really all objective criteria show that. So this is what its errors look like, and even this is few year old uh, cycle, it's the same today. So, What's the of that? Uh, so, 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 so the color bar is here. It's about three. It's about three meter per second for zonal wind. So the point is, you see some forecast errors. These are mid latitude storm tracks, and because this is July, it's, it's larger in the southern hemisphere. But the major, the most important errors model has to think about are in the tropics. Okay, and they are in the upper tropical tropos troposphere and around the tropical tropopause. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's the same in in uh, in in. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, okay, so it's the okay. I can I can discuss this this magnitudes later on. I don't have time. This is, so this is the question. What are the stationary and time dependent properties of these forecast errors? And now I will skip explanation how is this problem solved practically I will uh, I will I can talk it about it later on if someone is interested I will just because I'm running out of time I will explain you uh, one important property of um, of the tropical data assimilation and then I will talk about these errors so uh, the major difference between the data assimilation in the mid latitudes and in the tropics is that in the mid latitudes the way we understand the dynamics is built on quasi-geostrophic theory, okay? 
And it says that uh, on, on average, the temperature and wind fields are, are in geostrophic balance or close to it. And this is respected when doing data assimilation. And this is also shown when you take errors in the geopotential and wind field and you correlate them. You find out very easily that this applies for the, for the short-range forecast errors. You can compare them to radio sounds. You find that this applies to a large degree. So in mid-latitudes, in the free troposphere, errors are approximately in geostrophic balance. And this has been uh, advocated in the early 80s by Philips. So, and it, it, is, it is how the data simulation in NWP is built, that we apply, uh, we assume that the dynamics of forecast errors is linear, and that the same equations which, which apply to the, to the flow also describe the, the, the dynamics of the forecast errors. And, but in the tropics, nothing of this works. So, so, and this is example. So in this case, I'm showing you just something from a very simple uh, model, or one level model. We take a single zonal it wind. Usually it's just a moisture dry model. Dry. This is dry, I should point out. This is a dry model, no, no moisture. That's and, hard because yes. geostrophic balance, moisture coupling is the key thing. Yes, yeah, yes, I, I'm not talking about moisture. So uh, I, I'm just talking about okay. basic dry dynamics. So we take a single observation at the equator and we try to assimilate it in the model the way it is done in the mid-latitudes. And this is the result you get. You get some uh, response in the temperature of the equator, and this is wrong. This is what the quasi-geostrophic thinking would produce at the equator. And this is not what's done because people have learned when they tried to do this in early 90s that this is wrong. And then what we do when, this is something I have done some years ago in my PhD, when you add information that tropics are not built uh, by the quasi-geostrophically balanced modes, but there are large-scale inertial gravity and mixed Rossby gravity, and there is, of course, Kelvin mode, then when you are adding these tropical, the relationships between temperature and wind field, which are characterizing tropical modes, you gradually reduce the balance between the wind and temperature field, and you remove the, uh, yeah, you remove the coupling. And then you also, um, you also trap the increments closer to the equator. So from this picture, which would result from the mid-latitude thinking, we end up in this case with this picture. And this one tells you that the zonal wind at the equator would be related to the, something which looks similar to the Kelvin wave, to the positive perturbation in the geopotential field. But this picture can look quite different depending on what you assume about the variance spectra of the forecast errors. And this is my point. This is completely different from mid-latitudes because in mid-latitudes, when you are thinking about what are the primary relationships between wind and temperature or wind and temperature errors, there is only one candidate, and that is quasi-geostrophy. In the tropics, you have many candidates. We can say many in relation to mid-latitude. You have a Kelvin wave coupling. You have a equatorial Rossby wave coupling. For example, N1, lowest equatorial Rossby mode, at the equator has a mass, has temperature wind coupling opposite to the Kelvin mode. And then you have all other modes, which all of these other tropical modes have different temperature wind coupling. So this is a problem which does not exist in mid-latitudes, okay? And so this makes tropical multivariate data simulation so different. And this is why in the systems like ECMWF, even you do very, very sophisticated uh, 4D VAR data simulation, which is multivariate in principle. I don't have time to explain it. We end up in the tropics with something which is univariate. And this is example. Okay, I will just look, please, at this plot. Forget these others because I don't have time. So this is from uh, two weeks ago, ECMWF system. So here there is a single wind observation located right here at the equator on Greenwich, and it is the southwesterly winds. You put it in your 4 var, as sophisticated as we have now on this planet, and you end up with something like this. So this is analysis increment. Uh, okay, so I will just say, this is, this temperature, the amplitude of the temperature increments are very small. They are up to 0.1 Kelvin. So this tells you two things. One thing is 
that still assimilating winds makes no information about temperature and vice versa. And the global observing system is still 99% made by temperature or mass field observations. And the other thing is that, uh, that even when this, uh, this coupling which you get from 4 var from the strong model constraint results in unbalanced analysis. So this is just gravity wave uh, signature which you find. Oh, okay. So, so uh, no, okay, now meteorologists speak. Can I answer you later this? Okay, okay, okay. I'm not saying it's a bad plot. I'm just saying that's how it is. Okay, so now I will, I'm going back to those uh, background errors of, oh, give me that, <laughs> of those background, <laughs> background errors of ECMWF, and I want to analyze them by using a normal mode expansion, which means I am expanding all prognostic fields into, uh, into, into normal modes, which are simply eigen solutions of the linearized dry equations. And so what are they built of? They are built of, of, the, of the half functions, which are meridional combinations of Legendre polynomials. Then we have waves. And then in the vertical direction, I have a numerically computed vertical structure functions, uh, which, I, uh, which I will jump through now. Uh, I can discuss it later if someone is interested. I will just show you again some results from this 4D VAR ensemble. Then I will show you some results from the NCAR ensemble Kalman filter system, which is also freely available data simulation system developed by the group, uh, by the group led by Jeff Anderson at NCAR, and this is the web page. And it, is, it makes use of the NCAR uh, climate model as the atmospheric model and the ensemble adjustment Kalman filter, and on this website you can find lots of, lots of information. So what we have done with this system, we have done what I call perfect model experiment. So what was the purpose of this experiment? The purpose was to really find out what would be the properties and flow dependency of the background errors in the case when, when the observation network is homogeneous, when the model is perfect, and when we don't suffer problems with the observation operators, okay? So for this, we have done a nature run by, by running one year model with observed SST. We have used this, this is, this is, this is called um, observing system ex simulation experiments. Then we, then we do, then we take observations from this nature run. We assimilate, we assimilate them back into the same system by using this wonderful uh, homogeneous on the sphere uh, network, which is quite, which has quite poor density, but is, is, is enough for T85 model, and we do it over three months. So, so I want to make a comment. Yes. Your T85 model with John McFarland in the NCAR community climate model has incredibly strange, strange and not very vigorous convection. Moisture coupling is I will, going to be yeah. very I, I will show it in a minute. Yeah. Okay. So I, I. So this is a perfect model experiment. Yeah, this yeah, is not a. Saying, nature yes. Will have a very different yes. Than well, coupling. this is not a perfect model, but this is the just to do a simulation no, no, free no, of. Yeah. Yes, you are right. I, 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 I agree with your comment. So, so now we compute, we compute properties of the background errors in this imperfect nature model. And uh, this is what they look like. So the most of convection in this model is developing over Indian Ocean and Indonesia. And then this is reflected in the forecast errors. What you see here are the, are the structures of forecast errors which show westerly and easterly propagation properties related to the, to the convection which is moving either east to, or the west. And then lower down in the lower troposphere, it looks quite like this because convection in this model is almost stationary in the in the. Yeah, that's the John McFarland dilemma: yes, yes, so, yes. bubbling convection. Yes, it. Course, this is. I'm just sure it, it it looks. So and here is what it looks like in the mid latitudes in the in the in simply uh, in in the upper troposphere. So what you see here are the forecast errors which are propagating westward, which are related to simple baroclinic systems which have preferable westerly, westerly propagation uh, direction. So what I would like you to notice is that the time and space scale in this model of these and these errors is, is relatively similar. 
And this is then what, what is reflected when you look at the time evolution of these errors. Now I split these errors into balanced, which means quasi-geostrophic, and unbalanced, propagating either to the east or to the west. And what you can notice is some 10-hour, 10 10-day, 10 sorry, cycle in the, in the unbalanced uh, large-scale errors in this simulation. And, uh, and then, but the total amount of the error variance is quite stable during the time. And it's all surprisingly, it, this can be by chance, it's similar in this perfect model framework and in the real, real world, real world, ECMWF system. So, um, okay, I will, <laughs> okay. now what is shown here, I'm showing you properties of the forecast errors as a function of the zonal wave number. This is just the amount of the forecast error, background error variance in the perfect framework in the ECMWF operational system and in another um, simulation with DART cam based on real data. So just forget this one because of lack of time and look at these two. So there is something very interesting. And that is, if you look at the forecast errors in the easterly and in the westerly, uh, westerly propagating inertial gravity modes, you find that the easterly propagating dominates all the time in ECMWF. And also in the perfect model, it dominates uh, below wave number six, seven. And, uh, and this is almost purely due to Kelvin waves because Kelvin wave is the most energetic Sing, it's also pure normal mode, and it's most energetic mode of the global, of the unbalanced mode of the global atmosphere, and this is reflected in the properties of the forecast errors in ECMWF. You see that this difference is running all the way to the end of the spectrum. Okay, so now I will just, uh, okay, and that is shown in this plot, So, but I will run about. This is the plot I would like to discuss. This plot is showing how effective, efficient is your assimilation system to reduce the errors in the, in the background field, in the first guess, by doing data assimilation. So this point three means that your assimilation step has, has reduced the, the spread or uncertainty in the background information by 30%, okay? And, and that is shown here separately for the balanced or quasi-geostrophic and for these two inertial gravity uh, spectra. So there are two very, should I finish? <laughs> there are two very, very, very significant things here. One, that both of these unbalanced and balanced motions have peak in the, in the, in the scale between five, zonal wave numbers five to 10. This is very interesting for data simulation. And the other one, that the westerly is, is more efficient. And this is related to the fact that there are Westerly propagating inertial gravity waves in the mid latitude related to the orography and related to the baroclinic system. I, I, I am just, just proving this. So uh, if we take, instead of perfect model, a real data cam, we get something completely different. And actually, uh, yeah, we have published this last year. We have shown that covariance inflation, which we have to do in real operational ensemble Kalman filters, is really doing, doing things to our... Uh, to our uh, data. Measure moisture yes. Stronger. So I will uh, I will just uh, run uh, I will just run to my uh, next to the last slide. So okay, I have tried very quickly to show you some properties which are related to these questions. And intentionally, I didn't want to show them at the beginning of my talk. But now, after I provoked you by some of the plots, I hope. So, so these are the questions. So the question is. How much of the errors in the short-range forecast globally is related to the quasi-geostrophic and how much to other type of flows? And how this depends on the horizontal and vertical scales? And then are the observations more efficient in, in, doing, in reducing forecast errors, in reducing ensemble spread, if you like, in the balanced or in the unbalanced motions, and how, again, this depends on the scale. And then how is the other spectra properties of the forecast errors in the tropical modes and in the extratropical modes related to the flow? And then how, how this perfect model framework, which is still very complicated compared to simplified model framework one can, could do, how this can help us to understand model error. And then uh, how, this, how the answer 
to all these questions depends on the system we use. So, so my, my, my main point in this talk is that for 30 years, the NWP systems for global, global NWP systems have been built on this notion that the forecast errors are quasi-geostrophic, which means that the tropics effectively were not really taken care of except as a part of this quasi-geostrophic and thanks to, thanks to all other improvements which were done in data assimilation, in tangent linear modeling, in the physics, in the resolution. But so what I am, what I'm saying here is that I believe that now it's really time given all other adva advances which happen in understanding of the, of the tropical uh, variability and intra-seasonal um, dynamics that it's really time for NWP community to, to reconsider this quasi-geostrophic framework of thinking and to, to rethink how to do data assimilation in order to move explicitly account for the tropical modes. And I, I think uh, Professor Maida agrees with me, and that's enough for me. I'm happy for this. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, since we are run running out of time, you Let's better move on with the next speaker. We should, we could just discuss it, you know.